Welcome to Sober Doc Coffee, a weekly coffee chat sharing experience, strength, and hope for anyone on the sober road to recovery. You can download Sober Doc Coffee weekly on all podcast platforms and check us out on Instagram at Sober Doc Coffee Podcast and on Twitter at Sober Coffee Pod. To learn more about us and to help support these sessions, visit online at Sober Doc Coffee. Here are your hosts, two guys on their own path to recovery, Mike and Glenn. Let's join them at the coffee shop. Glenn, what's up, brother? Good morning, good morning, doing, man. man? I'm, you know what? I'm I'm in a serious mood today. You were calling me G last time, and all I, I know that all, was all, all I could keep thinking about was G string. Uh, I'm like, damn, yeah, that's a different. That's a I whole different podcast for a whole different audience. I know I couldn't get that out of my head. Yeah. <laughs> so what's going on, man? Hey, I I just heard some maybe two words. I, I saw a snippet of something. Two words. Talk to me. Two words I swore would never happen in my life. What? And they were TikTok. I know, right? <laughs> Dude, come on. What are we doing? I know. This, well, is, this is getting stupid. we got to hit the next generation. Ugh. You know, it's amazing. What, the, what, the 12-year-olds? <laughs> yeah, well, you Maybe. know what? Let, let, let's yeah, uh, I, I, let's I talk really, seriously I, I for really a second. I really shouldn't joke about that. No, you shouldn't because... No. It, it, I mean, for it, me, I was 35 when this really kicked in, but yeah. there's some... You know, for, for right. us, we're, we're alcoholics, and, uh, and drugs are part of my story, and uh, absolutely a deep part of my story, but... That's the drug of choice for the twelve-year-old, the fourteen-year-old, the sixteen-year-old, and and TikTok. And, no, well, TikTok and drugs. You know, I mean, they're they're more they're they're more leaning towards, you know, ph- pharmaceuticals or fentanyl mm-hmm. <laughs> than they are to uh, to alcohol. I'm no doctor. <laughs> I preface. I'm no doctor, but you, you know, know what? We we should bring one in at some point. We, you know, we really should. We really should. So I'm being rude. We do have a table for three this I know. morning. Yes, we do. Yeah, and, the and I'm just talking all house. over them. Yeah, so the doc is back. So uh, John is back with us today. We're so grateful to have you, John. Um, thanks, 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 John. For Great having. to have you again, man. Yeah, thanks if, for having. Unbelievable. If you haven't heard it, go back to, and I don't know what order we're going to drop these in, but but go back and listen to uh, to the other. We'll have we'll have a couple of John episodes. P- please listen to it. There were so many nuggets in there. Wait, what's the title of that first one? I'm fucked. Now what? Yeah, I, I, we'll probably clean that up for social media. Well, we'll uh, we'll put some stars. Yeah, in some there, stars right? and asterisks and ampersands. <laughs> so that. Social media. I told, clean I told us my out. I told my daughter the other day I was describing something to her. I said, "Okay, it's the password is boom 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 ampersand." She goes, oh, "Say what?" I'm like, "Do you even know what a phone book is?" Um, anyway, they don't know ampersands for anything. But you know, John is back with us today, and if you get a chance, go back and listen. There were so many fantastic nuggets of of information there. You just got to kind of reread it. I'm a note taker. I came in, and it's funny because when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I came in and I was so beaten up. I was so, and I was just, I was, as Glenn likes to say, willing to do anything anyone told me to get better or to get well. And, uh, I would, I would take, I was like a student, man. I would just take I know, notes you and notes You came in with that journal and book and you would just like take and, all the and notes. And I looked around the table and like, I'm the only one doing that. Why, why am I the only one doing this? And, but no one corrected me. So I just kept doing it. I'm like, okay, this is. But there were so many nuggets of information that I wrote down, and that's what I felt about that first episode that we did with John. There's just so much good stuff. But I want to say before we kick off that um, at, behind the counter, you know, we're, we're talking about the podcast and we're talking about uh, the universe of people that, need, that are hurting, that need help. And, uh, and I got to tell you, John, your passion for the newcomer just came oozing out to me. Um, you know, and, and again, not that you don't have passion for the guy who's still struggling after four years of sobriety with certain character defects, et cetera, but your passion for the newcomer is just, it's, it it just oozes out of you. It it, it just, and, and I'm going to shut up in a minute here, but are you, I don't know. (laughs) Um, you're the funny one. (laughs) Um, but, but the thing is, is that there is there is this time period where you really need something, and John, you were there for me, and I just thank you for being there for me. I'll never forget it. And uh, so, what what are we going to talk about today, Glenn? I think uh, I think I had a topic in mind I'd love to talk about. But well, what do you, what do you think? Go ahead and lay it out. I mean, I got right. seventeen topics, but I mean, we have nothing prepared like like we rarely do. So <laughs> let's just rarely. So. Um, Love that word rarely. One of the things that uh, that we I learned in the rooms and a lot from Dr. John is this concept that really hit home to me because 
because as I got better, I thought, okay, well, I'm I'm better now. So I had alcohol. You know, I'm I'm no longer an alcoholic. I'm I'm good. And uh, and John really opened up and and uh, talked about the fact that it's alcoholism, not alcoholism. Can you expound on that a little bit, Doctor John? Sure, that's right. Uh, you know, at the last uh, episode, uh, we talked about what are you really powerless over, uh, and and I can't emphasize enough, in my opinion, that believing, never mind about thinking and theorizing and talking, but believing in your gut that you're screwed, that mm-hmm. you're powerless, is essential. Uh, if I didn't believe that I'm powerless, uh, that I'm sick, that I, I can't make myself well, I'm not going to thoroughly follow the path. Mm-hmm. Now, the question is, what is it I'm powerless over? Uh, powerless over alcohol is the admission ticket. And you'll notice the word alcohol shows up only once in the 12 steps. Mm. It's the admission ticket, you know. Uh, and bad behavior, character defects, is not really what I'm powerless over. I'm powerless over my alcoholism. What do I mean by that? Now, I don't have a scientific explanation. I can only share with you metaphors that I've picked up over the years. And none of these are original. Well, maybe I made up a few of them, but <laughs> I pretty much stole them at meetings. And this is the first way I, I came, I was born scared. Okay? Mm. When I first started to try to convey in words what I meant by the ism of alcoholism. And by the way, I think the ism is the core issue that underlies any addiction, regardless of the object of addiction whether it's alcoholism or sexaholism or foodaholism or whatever the object of addiction, I think the ism is the core issue. Mm-hmm. What is this ism? Uh, I, I don't think it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. If it was, I'd go see my good friend, Dr. Uh, Helen Brenning, no and get some med- medications, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't think it's stupidity. I think it's, I was born scared of what, I don't know, everything and nothing. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a hole in the soul. That doesn't explain anything, but I have this void. Uh, I have this yearning for wholeness, a yearning for connectedness, a thirst for God. I had the great privilege of having several talks with Father Martin many years ago in the Mm -hmm. early 80s. And uh, you may not remember him, but he was a Catholic priest, very charismatic, world-renowned speaker. Does he have a a podcast? Uh, He (laughs) may have. He used to do the chalk talk. All the rehab centers used to do his chalk talk. Anyway, he's long gone now, but... He, he was giving a talk down in Atlanta at a uh, medical-sponsored addictions convention, and he was the keynote speaker. And I think he kind of sold out because he's up to talking about psychodynamics and the unconscious and the brain chemistry. Wow. And, and I'm looking around, and all these people are nodding their heads and taking I'm thinking, I just, it, that doesn't make sense. So I grabbed them during a break, and I said, Father Martin, I said, what am I not getting here? I said, it's not a disease in the usual sense. You know, it's, it's not a psychiatric. And he looked around like nobody's watching. And he said, John, he says, I don't know. And then I listen. Because when people think they know, they've stopped learning. But when this well-respected man who had 30 years of recovery, he's a Catholic priest with 30 years of program, said, I don't know. He says, I think the common denominator, I think the core issue is a thirst for God. He said, if there's anything that alcoholics thirst for more than alcohol, they thirst for God. And I thought, yeah. Now, you know, I went down there as a shrink looking for answers that I could use in my practice. I thought, how am I going to sell that and charge people money? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. people come in and say, you have a thirst for God, pay me, you know. But I think that that's, again, it's a metaphor, perhaps, a hole in the soul, a thirst for God, a yearning for wholeness, a yearning for connectedness, a spiritual hunger. I think it is a disease, but I think it's a spiritual dis-ease. Yeah, I love that. I love that because uh, in in all the time that we've spent in meetings together, uh, you know, that sounded like a spiritual pitch, but that wasn't a spiritual pitch. What you're suggesting is that there is this hole in the soul, this void that needs to be filled and I've heard you say before, it's kind of God poking at you. But again, you're not, you you never launch into these spiritual, so I kind of picked that up there, but it's it's not that. It's it's this void that you're talking about. If, if, go ahead. Look. Yeah, no, I'll just, um, in fact, over many years, you know, when we start talking about spirituality, I there's not a time when I hear the word spiritual or somebody's being spiritual where I don't remember what you yeah. or, oh, yeah. or re, re, recall what you said when you say, hey, when, when somebody says they're spiritual, grab your wallet, grab your genitals, and run out of the room. Yep. All right. Because right? yep. yep. there's a lot of that. But I, I relate back to a couple of the key things you said, the spiritual 
dis-ease, mm-hmm. the born scared. You know, because, I mean, I've been to so many rehabs and talked to so many doctors, and I've been to pill throwers, and, and, and they all want to go to your childhood, right? Something screwed up in your childhood. In fact, one doctor even said, you know, that I was adopted and— well, I'm sorry, but there, there was one doctor who actually said, well, oh, I think you had a crystallization within the womb, and, and that caused your fragileness, which, which makes you drink. And, wow. And I'm like, wow. You know, that's what I said. I'm like, wow. But, but I think to, 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 to give you a term that I relate to, that I live off of, when I was growing up, I grew up in a Christian household, and I think some of it was wacky. And, and the way I look back, I mean, 80% of that I don't even subscribe to because I, I think that there's a better way of looking at it. It's not about the rules. It's about a relationship with your higher power. But, but I think I was born with, with what I refer to today as true north, where I just know inside my soul what, what is the right direction for my path, the right way to live. And throughout my life, whether it was ego, whether it was chasing money, chasing, you know, I never had fame, but chasing notoriety, whatever word you want to use. You, know, you were I, in the police blotter. <laughs> no, I wasn't. No. Oh, wow. Never. Maybe once, um, but but I got away from that true north, you know, and and maybe even parts of my life I was direct one eighty from true north, and 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 what I have noticed over time, this has taken me time. This is not one of these. I'm on my knees in rehab, and I get this bolt of lightning, and I walk out, and I'm and I'm perfect. I don't believe. I mean, if that happens to somebody, that's great, but not, I'm on the slow train. But over time, I have found at least the zone of that true north again, right? And, and where I feel comfortable in the zone or, or the direction that I'm heading. I don't know if I'm even making sense, but, but I can really start to understand over time. I understand that dis-ease. And, and even today, when I go through, through my day, I can tell when I when I'm, have the dis-ease, <laughs> you know, when, when I'm off, you know, where, where my soul's off or, or, or whatever. Right, and it has nothing to do with alcohol. Can as I, you said, can yes, I get, go can, ahead. Can I get one of my dog stories in? Yeah, oh, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I, I think that ultimately the ism of alcoholism is the human condition in capital letters. What I mean by that is I think we humans are the only species that have the capacity to self reflect, to be consciously aware of our mortality, okay? to yearn uh, for spiritual things, to regret the past, to, to fear the future. And let me share with you uh, how I came to that. I was about five years sober, real quick. Five years sober, doing pretty well, I thought. I remember a January snowy afternoon. I'm watching the Bears game. Ditka was a coach. The Bears were actually winning. It was a good day. Wife and I were getting along well. My three little boys were ice skating on the pond. I'm feeling about Norman as, Rockwell. I'm, I'm just going to yeah, say yeah, Norman yeah, Rockwell exactly, Sunday afternoon. Exactly. I'm feeling about as good as I've ever felt. I look at my beagle, Kate, laying on the floor next to me. Now, you got to be a dog lover to appreciate this. Usually when I look at my be- my dog, I get a warm, gushy feeling. And this particular day, I look at her, and I get kind of a twinge of jealousy or resentment, a negative emotion. I mean, what is that about? And I start thinking, because I have to analyze everything. <laughs> and I look at her, and she's laying her on her back, yawning, stretching, smile on her face, <laughs> licking her butt. And I'm thinking, I'm feeling about as good as I've ever felt. But I don't feel anywhere near as centered, as at peace, as at ease, as this freaking dog. Now i got to figure this out. I'm thinking, I had a good steak dinner. She had Alpo. I'm married to a lovely woman. She's been spayed. The dog, not the wife. Okay. Um, you know, I've got a few bucks in the bank. She can't even go pee unless I let her out. If anybody should feel content and secure and serene, and it should be wow. me. And then the light bulb goes on. She is not cursed by the human condition. Mm. She has no ism. She has no conscious awareness of self. Wow. You know. And is that a little head trippy? Yeah, I guess. No, but ma- ma- maybe we we'll just stick with soul hunger or holding the soul. And yeah, as Glenn touched, uh, like so many people, I try to fill that void with false gods. I wasn't aware of it. But since as far back as I can remember, even before I discovered booze, I've done everything alcoholically, you know. Mm-hmm. I excelled in school. I hated school, and I'm not very smart. I'm an only child of immigrant parents. My mom and dad had four years of formal education. And I think the ism does express itself as shaped to some extent by the environment, okay? Mm-hmm. I think that if I was born in the ghetto, I'd probably be the chief gangbanger, you know, driven, driven, mm-hmm. driven, okay? 
And in hindsight, I can see that, you know, I was the smallest shrimp on my swim team. I was the only guy to place in the state. I was captain. You know? And I'm not bragging. Mm -hmm. I'm just, but everything was fear driven. False gods, fill the void. The prettiest girl, that'll do it. You know, more A's, another scholarship. More is more, mm -hmm. more, more, better, more. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And as a result, I got pretty good at stuff. Yeah. You know, I developed some coping skills. And what did they call those in the A? Character defense. Damn. <laughs> isn't yeah. that so? Caught. That's I, awesome. I've told you the story of the man. I, if I'm getting too long winded, cut yeah. me off. Uh, I had the good fortune of 12 stepping a man early in recovery. And I was just getting on fire with this stuff. And, oh my God, this isn't about booze. This is about, you know, the alcoholism. And a man came to me. Turned out he was a psychiatrist, 62 years old. I don't know why I remember that. I thought he was very old. And long story short, he'd been said to a therapist, a Mayo Clinic, complaining of depression, anxiety, taking all kinds of pills. And somehow he wound up in my office. And uh, without going into great detail, I decided this man is a high-functioning alcoholic. And uh, because he had tried everything else, he reluctantly, skeptically gave AA a chance. In fact, I bribed him. I said, go to AA. If it doesn't help, you come back and I'll treat you free. He was impressed by that. He went to AA for a few months, X number of meetings. He came back and he said, you know, he says, you're right. This is what I need. These are my people. But one thing confuses me. He said, I'm 62 years old. And I never had any character defects till I got to AA. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And he was making a very astute observation. Yeah. A lot of the character defects are the world calls coping skills, mm -hmm. right? Their survival value in being cutthroat, being secretive, and being manipulative. You know, I won a lot of battles before I came to AA. I could never win the war. Yeah. You know, I, was, I remember being in a meeting. Um, you may or may not have been there. Glenn probably wasn't. He was probably golfing. Um, but uh, I, uh, I said out loud, and, and I didn't realize what I was saying until somebody came and said, wow. And it, and it was, I just said, I was an alcoholic long before I took the first sip of alcohol. Yep. And, and it was like an, as I said it, it was cathartic. It was like an epiphany to yeah. me. That's right. You know, the baby comes out crying. The baby doesn't come out laughing. I, I'm convinced at the point of conception, God looked down and said, let's leave some of the insulation out on this guy. And make, <laughs> make him a thin-skinned person and send him through a thick-skinned world. I love that. We're pain augmentors. And I don't know the time I'll tell you guys about a study at some point that we alcoholics are pain augmentors even before we meet alcohol. They did a study where kids that had the alcoholic gene who later became active alcoholics, you uh, expose them to noxious stimuli, whether it's physical, like a pinch, or an insult. The normal kids, the control group, would say, ouch, you know, mm -hmm. or, oh, you hurt my feelings. The, the, the alcoholic kids would go, ow, mm -hmm. and they'd sob. Right. Yeah. Hypersensitive. Yeah. Can I hit your hot button? What does that mean? Uh, I, got a, I got a question for you. Sure. Um, it's an allergy, John. Talk to me about the allergy. Well, I, I don't want to offend, you know, big book thumpers. I, I think the big book is an amazing book, way ahead of its time. Uh, it's our Bible. Um, but I don't take every word literally, you know. And, you know, I'm a Catholic, so I don't squat about the Bible. I mean, yeah. you're much better versed than I am. But people who take the Bible literally make me a little nervous, you know. I, mean, I think there's a lot of truth and wisdom in there, but it's metaphorical. And, and like man with the big book. I know the big book says the doctor's opinion that it's an obsession of the mind and an allergy of the body. My feeling is if you have an allergy, take some Benadryl mm -hmm. or go see an allergist. Uh, obsession. I obsess about lots of things. I obsess about my ingrown toenail. I obsess about, you know, it's an attempt to make it a disease, but that's not, you know, so, so far as I know, so far as I know, I could be wrong. I think there is no evidence, scientific evidence, factual evidence that we alcoholics are neurophysiologically, neurochemically, or physiologically any different from other people. Mm -hmm. I think we metabolize alcohol the same way. When I drink too much, it, alcohol does to me what it does to anybody. Okay? It inhibits my inhibitions and I act badly. Mm -hmm. okay? It inhibits the part of the brain that makes me different from a dog. Mm -hmm. The frontal lobe which says, no, you don't screw your neighbor's wife, you don't take your clothes off at a party, mm -hmm. that gets inhibited. Mm -hmm. okay? does that to everybody. That's why normies get drunk, act badly, but then they don't do it again. Mm -hmm. Okay, Because what, we're different, in my opinion, that in, it, it does something for us. Right. It soothes that ism. It gives us relief from ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I know I go off on these yeah, long no, tangents. You know, the fi and the reason I brought it up is because um, that, that'll, <clears throat> like you said, you take Benadryl. If I eat Roth, if I if I eat shellfish and I blow up, first of all, I take Benadryl. Secondly, I don't eat 
right. selfish again, right. Right. you know. But with and and so I I guess I brought it up because I don't want people to get hung up on the word of allergy because it's the it's the concept that we as me as an alcoholic once I hit that first sip it's all bets are off that's just the way that because of what it does for because you of what I, I don't have an me. allergy I have an affinity for affinity, alcohol right that craving yep. is not a symptom of allergy craving is a symptom of an affinity right I don't crave to be swollen right. up by the shellfish Right. Now, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know why alcohol soothes my ism better than anything. And for some people, food be soothes their ism. And mm -hmm. for some people, uh, gambling soothes right. the ism. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that is. Gambling right. does nothing for me. Right. You know? right. Nothing for me either. Right. I mean, just, but I mean, booze for me, and it's funny, I just went through shoulder surgery and I took, you know, two weeks worth of, you know, and I told my doctor and, and my sponsor knew and my wife watched my pills and I, so I was, but you know, talk to my doctor and my sponsor. Like, you know, just because you're an alcoholic, you shouldn't have to go through. I mean, shoulder surgery is painful. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't have to do that. That shouldn't be a punishment for right. being an alcoholic. So right. I took two weeks of opioids. In one day? Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sorry. My bad. That's, that's my hilarious. Bad. That's hilarious. But you know what? I don't have it. They do nothing for me. Right. right. You know, but booze, I mean, it worked for a good period of time. I mean, it was a magic you know, and I was cool be before I drank, but somehow that, it just really worked. And so my my brain remembered all the good times that, that it worked. In fact, even now, and, and we've talked about this, but even now, it can be a boring Tuesday afternoon. I got six phone calls coming ahead of me, and I can remember the days where I had a solo cup full of vodka. And I, and I my, my brain today says, remember how great that was? Mm -hmm. Remember how smooth that afternoon went? Mm -hmm. Remember how good you were? And I probably wasn't good. I probably right. blew, but, you know. But that's what my brain tells me today that, hey, maybe it'll be different this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but that's why I keep coming back because yeah. that those thoughts have not gone away for me yet. I think the memory of the painful consequences tend to fade over time. Right. Okay? You know, uh, those are up here in my brain. Well, it wasn't that bad, you know, and. Yeah, my wife's gone now, so she won't be upset. And if I lose a car, I can buy another one. Mm -hmm. But what it does for me, that memory is in my soul. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Ah, I don't have to stop and think, why did I drink? You know, and I'm, I'm as you know, I relapsed after 15 years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and getting back to your original question, why do I get long-winded? Alcoholism versus alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Okay. This hole in the soul, the spiritual dis-ease, whatever it is, it's important for me to realize that it's still there. I sometimes hear people talk in a program as if they were alcoholic, but they're right. not anymore, you know. And that's the danger of the, the false assumption that alcohol is a problem. I drank, my life was shitty. I'm not drinking, my life is better. Hallelujah. And I'm like, I knew that before I came to AA. I didn't need an A to mm -hmm. tell me that drinking was a bad idea, you know. What I need an A for is that even when I don't drink and things get better, mm -hmm. you know, and I clean up my act, uh, I still have this hole in the soul. I still yearn. I'm still hungry. That's why I need to continue to work the program. I yeah, love and, it, and to underline that, I mean, ninety percent of the people are so don't come back, right? <clears throat> or they try for a while. And everybody, I talked to a guy last night who, you know, is now back, right? And he drank yesterday, and that, and I had an hour painful conversation with him. And just like everybody that comes back. What happened? Well, I stopped coming to meetings. I stopped working the program. I stopped staying connected. I started, you know, blah, blah. And, and that's why I, I just wrote down, keep working. That's why I do mm -hmm. this stuff every single day because I have enough proof from watching other people, you know, that if you pull back, you know, it's going to come back. Right. You know, it boils down to this. I know for me, and I that's think it's true. I think it's true for any alcoholic. I have three ways to go. Drunk dry and sober. I can do drunk by myself. And if it wasn't for the, for the painful consequences, I'd still be doing mm -hmm. it. I can do dry by myself. I don't know about you, but for me, dry becomes so unbearable in time. I'd rather that, drink. That I'd rather drink. Yep. I cannot do, I never knew there's a third, so, a third choice. For 20 years, I bounced between drunk, dry, drunk, dry, drunk, dry. And I had enough pain to finally get my butt into AA. I had enough pain to stick around a while because I didn't catch on right away. It took a while. I realize, there's a third option called sober, and maybe we'll get into it in the next session. What's sober? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, what's sober? Will you come back and talk about that? Sure. Uh, John, this has been great, man. Thanks, Thank doc. you so much. It's always great to have a visit with the doc. That's right.
Thanks Thank for, you. Thanks for Thank having you me. Thanks much. for having me, guys. See you, see you brother. It's been fun. Thanks for joining us for today's Coffee Chat. To contact the show, email us at podcast at sober.coffee. If you need immediate help, the AA hotline is 800-839-1686. The National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 800-273-8255. Remember, Mike and Glenn are sharing their own journey on the path to recovery. Any suggestions, medical or otherwise, are their own experiences and should not be viewed as professional advice. See you next week, and remember, there is a solution.